The West Penra Papers A Journey Through the Multiverse The First Level of Learning HTTP colon slash slash westpenry.com Solution Section Solution Paper Number 2, Earth is Real Estate By Wes Penra, Monday, July 25, 2011 1. All biological life is seeded. Everything that has a biological form has been designed. The butterfly, the cockroach, the bird, the lion, the moth, the snake, humans, except for the fatalists, who may think that all that is just came to being by accident and evolution, most people agree, in spite of different religions or beliefs. Most religions, sects, cults, and freethinkers believe there is a divine design to all life on earth and in the universe. The question is, why do so many people believe in a huge man with long hair and a long, white beard? Because, that's how God, or the gods, depicted themselves in the minds of human beings. The ultimate design of this universe and beyond is created by all that is, or source, something we have discussed in earlier papers, and source then created a semi-hierarchy of appointed creator gods. I say semi, because it's not a strict hierarchy as in, you take order from me, and you are in charge of them over there, and that's how it's done around here. It's rather a hierarchy of knowledge and the ability to create matter out of light, how to be masters in creating holographic illusions and manipulating DNA, which is not limited to the human body, but continues spiraling out over the universes. Thus, everything that has a biological form has been designed. Very little has evolved in the manner Dr. Charles Darwin taught us. Humans, for example, have looked the same since we were last genetically manipulated by the Syrian Anunnaki. The elephant did not evolve out of the mammoth and the mastodon, or the bird from the dinosaur, they are different creations altogether. And life did not spring out of nothing. Nothing is random, it's all been built and seeded with a purpose in mind. In our case, like mentioned so many times before, the purpose is the living library. Earth's original creator gods wanted to build life on this planet, both plant, animal and human life, which would be a mix of biological life from hundreds, if not thousands, of planets and star systems around the cosmos. From our perspective, we can look at it as a giant library, where species from near and far can come and study how biological life forms interact and evolve as body slash mind slash spirit. It's a great experiment and the creator gods are very determined to protect their library to the best of their abilities. Ancient texts speak of ETS, way back in the past, introducing the rudiments for agriculture, animal husbandry, teaching us about astronomy, astrology and metallurgy. These are all rudiments to build a civilization on a world such as ours, Pleiadian Lecture, June 6, 2010, built on a mirage, CD number 3, track 8. Many of these creator gods, in a joined effort by other alien species, are still watching us in our development today, as we have built this civilization based on the knowledge we gained in the far past. However, in our foolishness, we could more or less have blown ourselves up hundreds of times the last 50 years or so, but these old creator gods, who watch but don't want to interfere with our development, make sure we are not destroying ourselves, and in particular, this planet. This is why we see UFOs around man-made reactor blow UPS like the one in Japan in the earlier part of 2011. This is also why we hear of UFOs who have destroyed missiles which have been sent off but stopped mysteriously halfway to the target. Creating a civilization like ours was part of the original plan and a part of a normal development on any life-bearing, given planet. There is a time in the development of most intelligent species, where they, as adolescents are playing with their toys and almost destroy themselves and their world in the process. However, like a separate human grows from adolescence to adulthood, so should we as a species, before we blow each other up. This is a critical stage in our development, and we, as a humanity, have been unusually asleep during this critical process and let the most destructive adolescents play with the most dangerous tools. Therefore, we who have grown up past this point since long, need to help the teenagers, most of the population, to grow up as well. However, 
there is an agreed upon moratorium on the highest level of creator gods to make certain that the atomic energy is contained. Pleiadian Lecture, June 6, 2010, built on a mirage, CD number 3, track 8. There are ETS who have told the highest level of governments that if we want assistance, we need to disarm ourselves, and no weapons in space. When the government or the media are using the words atomic energy, or nuclear energy, they are often code words for ETS, IBID. Obama, and others before him, manipulated behind the scenes by those, ETS and humans, who are not willing to give the power back to the people, know about this and have actively destroyed underground ET bases, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico being just one example. UFOs who have entered our reality have been shut down, cold-bloodedly, and if any survivors, they have either been killed or captured. All this is, and has been, happening behind the scenes for a long time, and it's talked about in the media all the time, but it's coded. By using terms as atomic energy, nuclear energy slash power, the global elite, who know how to read the Bible, newspapers, read it very differently than the rest of the people. For them, the media are delivering encoded news, and they know how to read between the lines. A news reporter is telling a story, but the average Joe is hearing one thing, while Mr. Rothschild is hearing another. You have to be initiated to get the real message. 2. The Free Will Zone The original creator gods worked with, and were carefully guarding a certain aspect of consciousness called light. These guardians of light worked with, and for, the prime creator in an effort to expand consciousness by creating experiments of probabilities which consciousness could experience and expand itself, and thus also expand all that is, the prime creator. These highly evolved beings knew what can be done with light, and their plans were carefully orchestrated and it was decided when they were going to go into effect. The plan for Earth was to be an exchange center of information for all the different galactic systems. Everything was very carefully planned, and many of these creator gods incarnated here on Earth as a part of this plan, to light candles in the dark and eventually defeat the darkness just by being able to emit and transmit high frequencies of light. These incarnated creator gods, who have been here and lived through all this darkness in human bodies, have not given up. They are still here and their time is now. Their mission is no longer to light a candle, but to become beings of light whom by their presence alone will make the darkness in others and the environment to diminish and disappear. Are you one of them? If you feel you are, now is your time. Light gives information without even having to use words, while darkness withholds information. With this in mind, it's easier to see who is who in this otherwise complicated game. Once you start traveling outside the third density realm, you will still keep this in mind. Darkness keeps you disinformed and light keeps you informed. If someone is wanting to expand by becoming more light from retrieving more information, and the information the person wants is being withheld from him slash her, the one who withholds is holding on to darkness. Very soon, times will change drastically, and everything that was hidden will come to the surface and shown to the world, in ratio to how much light will be spread and how fast it will travel. The darkness which has been so prominent here on Earth for so long will no longer prevail. It's already starting to happen big time. Just look at what is being revealed right now in all walks of life. These are not the times when it's an easy task to hold on to secrets, they will reveal themselves. According to the original plan, the Creator Gods act like parents for what they create. Earth, like so many other planets in the Free Will Universe and others, are real estate and meant to be owned by the creator gods who seeded them, but real estate can easily change stewardship over time, through wars, invasion and any other reason for that matter. But if everything goes per the plan, the parents let their children grow up while guarding them, until they are adults and can take over the real estate. Each team of creator gods are seeding more than one planet at the time, and due to that time in the universe is not linear it can on one level all be done simultaneously. There have been many different creator gods interfering with the human DNA over billions of years, and many claim stewardship over Earth. There will be those who will come here, presenting themselves as helpers and saviors of this world. 
people will embrace them and think they are wonderful and powerful gods, look what they can do. When everything is going downhill on the planet, and an alien race is coming down to offer a solution, many will swallow the bait without seeing the bigger picture. All they are doing is to create another, new form of control. The old world order goes out the window to make space for a new world order. Peace and prosperity is offered, some will say they are staying here as long as it takes for humankind to grow up and be self-sufficient and then leave. This is when it's so important to understand our own past, where we come from and who has been stewarding us, and in what direction. The same creator gods who created all these wars and all this chaos now come back and tell us they have cleaned up their act and can help us because they feel responsible for us. There will be, and already is, a gigantic marketing program to introduce the return of the gods, and it's very cleverly done. Once they come, and after they have cleaned up here, they will reign in peace for a while, but knowing their history, we will soon find ourselves in a highly technological tyrannical environment, much worse than the one we're experiencing now. Don't get fooled, people. Instead of giving any more power away to the gods who put us in this mess in the first place, we need to work on creating our own planetary sphere, our own Earth. It already exists, we only have to picture it. If we are to use the working model, which I introduced in the physics papers, as a base for how the multiverse operates, we understand that just as thoughts travel on Earth, there are highways on which thought can be directed throughout the cosmos. We need to dance between frequencies, knowing what we want and rest assured that we get it. The power is within us, not with any landing alien force. Please remember this when things start taking off. There are many different types of universes that were created with different purposes in mind. Even different galaxies have different purposes. We live in a free will universe, which means everything goes. All aspects of consciousness have gathered here to have a totally wild experience in an effort to learn as much as possible. You can do anything you like, but there are consequences. There are physical laws here based on karma what you give out, you get back. This too, is set up so that energies meet energies and bounce back to the instigator of thought and action slash inaction. This is how energies work here. If we look at it objectively, it can be a great system for the prime creator to experience itself. The multitude of experiences are extremely fast pace. Here, we affect each other, because that's how consciousness experiences itself. In another universe, everybody may be absolutely free, be on their own and serve no purpose to anybody else. In this free will zone everything is interlocking and interworking with everything else. The Pleiadians put it this way. Your purpose is to carry information and, by carrying it, to make the information accessible to others by frequency, information is light, light is information. The more you become informed, the more you alter your frequency. You are electromagnetic creatures, and everything that you are, you broadcast to everyone else. Your assignment is to carry information and to evolve yourself to the highest capability within the human form. When you do this, you cannot help but affect multitudes. Everything you come in contact with is affected by your vibration, Marciniak 1992, Bringers of the Dawn, pages 139 OPCIT. 2.1 Free Will vs. Predestiny when we talk about free will, we can't discuss it in any length without also bringing up predestiny. We need to do so, because in some religions, the followers believe that everything is predestined. Even in secular groups people believe everything is predestined. There is even something called fatalism, meaning everything is fated and there is no way around it. I happened to see a bumper sticker yesterday on the car in front of me, saying, even those who believe everything is predestined look for cars before they cross the street. That's quite profound. The truth is that it's a little bit of both. In metaphysics paper number 4 we were discussing what is happening between lives, how we set new goals for what we perceive being the next lifetime, although from a higher perspective all lifetimes are simultaneous, whom we want to meet, what we want to do, and so on. When we incarnate to a certain time we meet with our tribe or soul group. 
We have a certain tribe we meet with when we are kids and adolescents and another tribe when we pass our twenties etc. Sometimes, one or two members of the childhood tribe stay with us throughout our lifetime, but that's not too common. Of course, your immediate family usually does. We could say that predestiny is the overall experience that we have decided upon before incarnation, but within the framework of these happenstances we are free to do whatever we want to do. We can even change the whole setup we planned out between lives if we suddenly decide, while in incarnation, that we want to do something totally different. That's the beauty of free will. Those who say that you have to do this, and you have to do that because it's predestined imply that there is no free will whatsoever, and that is not at all true for this particular universe. Free will is a most predominant factor. Let's say that when a person is 25 years, 2 months, 3 weeks, and 6 days old he is predestined to meet his life partner at a party, because that's what the two have decided upon before they incarnated. However, in the last minute he decides that he is too tired to go and he stays home instead. This means the predestined meeting never happens as planned, and all he had to do was to decide not to go. As easy as that. The woman may have gone to the party, though, but felt that something was missing and left early. Usually, meetings like these are predestined to happen due to correlation and in accordance with astrological signs, and important events in a person's life are often planned under a certain astrological attuning to have the most powerful effects. In our example, as it turned out, the young man blew it off for any reason, and let's say that he instead meets with the lady three years later in another space and time. They may still get married, but the astrological signs are different, and they may or may not achieve exactly what they had planned. You can plan anything you like between lives, but there's always that unknown factor in fact, a big unknown factor called free will which may spoil it or lead you in another, sometimes even more desirable, as it turns out, direction. Predestiny is something set into the perceived future while free will is always the choice in the present moment. Looking at it this way, you can easily see which one is predominant over the other. 3. Revisiting Old Egypt Era of Magic and Multidimensionality I am taking you on a multidimensional tour in this paper, explaining things in a more nonlinear time frame to get the reader used to this kind of thinking. Hence, I now want to take you back to Old Egypt for a while. The Egyptian people have always been quite different from people from the rest of the world in certain terms. They have a history that is pretty rich in many ways, not the least due to alien presence and influences on their society. In previous papers I have described in detail Sitchin's translations and interpretations of the Sumerian cuneiform tablets, describing the Anunnaki's involvement in the building of Egypt and cultures in many other parts of the world. In subsequent papers in that series of papers I will continue discussing other alien influences coinciding with the Anunnaki timeline here on Earth. They were not the only ETS on this planet in the old Egyptian era and at other times. All these alien civilizations affected the Egyptian culture enormously, of course, and also the people, not only the cultural part, but also from a genetic aspect, with a lot of interbreeding and genetic engineering. This has made the Egyptians quite a psychic people and in some senses a bit more multidimensional in their thinking than much of the rest of the world. Therefore, it's interesting to watch what happened in Egypt earlier this year, in 2011, with the uproar against the sitting regime and how it was done. What we are seeing on a higher level is timelines merging. This incident is not the first, but it's a bigger one and we will see more of timelines coming together and meeting at an apex. When the gods were interacting with us, especially those with questionable reputation, to say the least, knowledge was passed on through the mystery schools. It often took many lifetimes for the human initiates, often royalties, Anunnaki hybrids, first or second generation, trained in the priesthoods to open their eyes to other realities. The gods trained them to reincarnate into certain families and remember who they were. The mothers and fathers knew who was going to incarnate into the baby body before the baby was born, because they dreamed about it. With training they learned to see and interpret different realities. This concept was called the Eyes of Horus, or the Third Eye of Horus, A.D. 2002, Voyagers 2, Miscellaneous Pages, 
because they could look into many different worlds, the world of waking and of sleeping, the world of death and that of dreaming, Marciniak 1992, Bringers of the Dawn, p.74. What some of the gods did, and still do, which they did not teach their human students because they didn't want us to be a threat to them, or in competition, was that when their current body either grew old, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years old, or even millions, got fatally wounded in battle or accident, or got seriously ill, they could quickly vacate that body and immediately incarnate into another cloned version of themselves and continue their lives without passing the between lives. Area which I tend to believe is only assigned for us ignorant 3D soul fragments. These gods did not do so casually, though, because each clone is always a little bit less powerful and efficient than the previous one, but apparently they were afraid to die the natural way. There is a reason for this, which I will bring up in the second level of papers. Our original strands of DNA, which we are now redeveloping, are seemingly of a higher order and can take us higher up on the echelons of the multiversal ladder than they can the Anunnaki. We are talking 11 strands versus 12 stands of DNA. The Anunnaki made a choice a very long time ago which they regret today. This is also particularly interesting, because this knowledge has been passed on down the generations of certain families through mystery schools and secret societies to present time. Today's royal families and global elite families do the same thing, certain soul fragments incarnate over and over into the same genetic line having full memory of who they are. Interestingly enough, this doesn't necessarily make today's global elite particularly spiritually inclined. Yes, they know they are soul fragments occupying a bio-mind, but they don't always see the bigger picture beyond their own accomplishments and designed tasks. However, I should add, some of them do. There are those who know who they are and why they do what they're doing. Although we may look at them as evil because of the effects they create, there is certainly a bigger picture that most people miss, those who have read the Hidden Hand article may understand this concept better. A few beings incarnated over and over on this planet to be our catalysts. By doing horrendous deeds, they are also sacrificing themselves by inducing very difficult karma upon themselves, and they are doing this to make us wake up. We are blaming them for what they do instead of understanding that the magnitude of darkness put upon us by these people are in direct ratio to our own inefficiency, negligence and inability to wake up and complete the task we're here to do. By another token, the A.A.M.I. People, as it seems, go from incarnation to incarnation with full memory of their previous one without reflecting over what they're doing and their real purpose. Hence they have since long forgotten what the meaning of their thoughts and actions are. Like in the Michael Lee Hill case, as discussed in another paper, Marduk, if it was him, is perhaps seeming to understand this catalyst phenomenon and is telling Hill that now when humanity is waking up, he and his people can finally find rest from being our catalysts and start expressing love in a positive way. However, I doubt that this is a sincere attempt and that Marduk is just playing on what he considers fashionable amongst UFO and alien researchers here on Earth to look at the Anunnaki as catalysts. He wants us to believe that his people now have changed, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a trap. And as far as Michael Hill is concerned, it is my conviction that even if some people are our catalysts and we realize this, it doesn't mean we should, or have to mingle with them. Never before have so many people lived on Earth as in these times. We need the numbers to be able to pull Earth through her birth pain and transfer us to a higher frequency. It's our combined effort that will make this happen, thus the 7 billion people plus that will live on this planet between 2012 to 2017. Not everybody will be able to transform and it's not meant to be, but everybody is contributing with their own frequency, wittingly or unwittingly, to make this happen. Still, all these people know that they were born into this specific time because of what is transpiring. Some just want to ride the wave and have fun, or a certain experience, while others are serious about where they want to go. They will check out and leave their bodies when it's getting tough, and that's something they had planned before they were even born. To those, let's send our gratitude for being here with us, who have planned to stay, for helping us on our journey. It's all perfectly fine, but we still need more people waking up to increase the overall frequency.
we literally need to shed light into the darkness by being ourselves and affect our environment, creating the ripple effect we discussed earlier. According to the Pleiadians, many well-known people from the past chose to come back at this particular time as well to participate in the energy work. I am slowly taking you back in time here, inserting dialogues that are multidimensional in nature for a reason, which will be apparent before you've read this paper until the end, and Egypt has had such a profound effect on humanity both positively and negatively that we need to grab a handful here and a handful there of their history and place it in present time to understand our current path and what is happening to us today. By understanding certain sequences of the past, we will make the transition easier for those who want to follow. The first thing that comes to mind to many people if you say Egypt is the pyramids of course. There are pyramids found in all different places on earth, and there are those buried deep in the jungles, overgrown with layers of vegetations, but the most famous ones are the Egyptian pyramids. 3.1 The Pyramid Structure and What It Does First of all we want to be clear that pyramids are not something that originates with the global elite because it's on the back of the $1 bill, albeit the elite know the power of the pyramid and it also symbolizes whom they are working for. I just want to demonize pyramids right away, because for many people who have studied the global elite and their plans see pyramids as something only related to them, and therefore evil. The universe we live in is built around the language of light. Light actually has geometric forms, like circles, squares, rectangles, pyramids, triangles, spirals, lines, pentagons etc. These who have this knowledge know the power of geometry and the shape of the pyramid. It's as old as the universe, because it's been present as long as there has been light, but the founders used the pyramid shape, alongside many other geometric shapes, already when they started seeding the universe. These creator gods are still around in pure consciousness and are here to help us, emitting tremendous energy of love and light. We humans have 144,000 seals of energy that will eventually be infused within our being. This entire symbolic language structure will be infused throughout being. The pyramids on this planet are primary locator points, and throughout cosmos represent a great unity of consciousness. They are the structure of perfection and very difficult to create. This structure gathers energy from Earth and sends it outward. They have also been a sighting point for landing of alien spacecraft, especially when they arrive from other dimensions and densities. When we think of the pyramids we think of them as being built during a certain time period and that they filled some kind of purpose at that time for the builders, and that the Great Pyramid was built around 2600 BC. That may be true on one level, but if we look at it from a more multidimensional viewpoint, we could picture the pyramids being built simultaneously at different point in vertical time and inserted onto the planet, filling different purposes at different times. According to the Guardian Alliance, for example, the Great Pyramid was restored in 5540 BC, Ashayana Dean 2002, Voyagers 2 p.86. We know from Sidishan's work that the Anunnaki were the builders at one time, but we also know from the RA material that the RA Confederacy, the RA Collective, also were the builders. The Pleiadians refer to this multidimensional concept as well in one of their winter lectures of 2011, including the original cedars of this planet as an addition to the mix. In fact, the pyramids, on another level, are a measure of local and planetary consciousness, working as a chronometer, telling inter- and multidimensional creator gods where the overall level of consciousness is and how an upcoming harvest would pan out for humanity. Egypt is not the only country which has these measuring devices built into the pyramids, they are all over the place, and they fill this same purpose, on one level built by the same beings. When a certain consciousness is reached, it sends out a signal through time so that this consciousness can be balanced. Some of the true pharaohs of Egypt, who were of higher consciousness, said that the pyramids were ancient even before they began, Pleiadian Lecture, Freedom's Frenzy, February 12, 2011, CD No. 1, Track 13. It's obvious that the pyramids were built to survive through time and not only serve a purpose for a short time period. We also learn from the same Pleiadian Lecture that long ago, there were pharaohs who were taught by ETS how to pay attention to time inside their mind and when something went off in another time, 
like today, they could respond from their present, our past, to influence the future. As all time is simultaneous and no one really dies, they knew how to work through time and balance things out within the framework of their own capacity, through the pyramids. In other words, they didn't take precautions back then in case something would happen in the future, they are there now, in our past, which is their present and able to respond to what for example was happening in Egypt a few months ago from this writing. This is a very interesting and accurate way of looking at multidimensionality. If you can picture this and can think with it, you can grasp the concept of how multi-D works. As you may know, we do have proof there are pyramids built on other planets as well, such as Mars. These NASA pictures are all over the internet. This is telling us, that for somebody, pyramids are pretty important. They've been used for initiation, energy enhancers, tombs, later on when the dynasties were declining and consciousness declined as well, lighthouses for travelers through time and space, unity of consciousness and anchor points in time, teleportation and ascension among other things. They are also an encapsulation of the language of light, a code for building, just like a hammer can be used for different things in different hands. So, the Great Pyramid in particular could be said to be an anchor of energy. Time can be compared to a container where consciousness can express itself. As we have discussed so far, time as a linear concept is a local custom and is not applicable outside the realm of our planet. Therefore, if we look at the Great Pyramid as a time container, being multidimensional in concept, time in this container is not linear. Here, timelines merge, parallel timelines that have to do with Earth, or other versions of Earth. This is why a person may enter certain points within the pyramids who work like apexes for timeline energy and the visitor may have a very profound multidimensional experience. This was well known by the ancients. Now we can see how powerful the pyramid structure is, and how it can be used for so many incredible things. Still, here on Earth almost nobody knows what they are, why they are there, and when, and by whom they were built. It's a mystery. Timeline-wise, in the perspective of the linear, and the bloodlines from where the current version of humanity originates, it goes back around 500,000 years on this planet, which brings us back to the time when the Anunnaki arrived. 4. The Attractive Real Estate The Gods Return As discussed earlier, the Nibiruan A.A.M.I. seem to be in charge of real estate Earth at this time, and they are themselves a mix of humanoids and reptilians from have interbred with the reptiles from Orion, and who knows with whom else. The Pleiadians tell us over and again that there were multiple conflicts and wars between alien races here on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system before and after Homo sapiens sapiens were created. The A.A.M.I, a galactic and interdimensional warrior race, won these wars, and as part of the peace treaties, there were agreements made with the Orion Reptilians and the Dracos of Alpha Draconis to manage real estate Earth and its human inhabitants. Exactly how these agreements were made is unknown to me at this time, but it is quite obvious that both the Dracos and the Reptilians are controlling humankind while their bosses, the A.A.M.I, are elsewhere, only leaving skeleton crews on Earth. Every now and then they come back to check on us and their real estate, apparently when Nibiru is in crossing. This time is now, more or less, and we start seeing more of the typical A.A.M.I slash Anunnaki here on Earth. What we need to keep in mind, and this is extremely important, is that Marduk and others, like Ningish Zita slash Thoth, both sons of the Inki slash EA, changed history and slash or lied about important parts of it. Both brothers, independent of each other, and for different reasons, changed the records, probably withdrew some of the cuneiform, replaced them with falsified records, and like in Marduk's case, bluntly lied about their own history and that of humankind. Humankind were not some savages running around killing animals on the savannas of Africa with pointed sticks. There were more than one human species present on our planet when the Anunnaki came, and not all of them were highly spiritually evolved, but some were. They were living with nature but also had an advanced civilization, which was destroyed by the Anunnaki. Some, like David Ick, the Pleiadians, and a few others say that they were androgynous, even, 
with a genetic structure that allowed them to access, and interact with, a range of densities, David Ick 2011, Human Race Get Off Your Knees The Lion Sleeps No More, p.227. This was before we were genetically engineered by those from the incoming Nibiru. 4.1 Shape Shifting When we speak of David Ick, we come on touching the subject of shape shifting. In 1999 he released his now classic book called, The Biggest Secret, the book that will change the world, about shape-shifting reptilians. Changed the world it did in certain term, and those who came about this information were divided into two camps, for and against his latest research. What it did, successfully I think, was that he snapped people out of the third dimension slash density linear time paradigm and made people think more outside the box more multidimensionally. Even those who laughed at him and thought that he no had enough rope to hang himself were not unaffected. Humanity owes him a lot of credit for where we are today, he was, and certainly still is, a great contribution to the mass awakening. Today, 12 years after the book release, there are still two camps, but X camp is gaining ground and we are getting more and more tuned into his research and the future he is suggesting we'd head towards. I don't like using the word camps because it separates, but in lack of another term, and after all, they are camps. Ick is convinced that certain members of the global elite are possessed by reptilian entities from the lower fourth density slash dimension, who are manipulating our world leaders from an unseen world. Sometimes these reptilians show themselves in their real form and people from all around the globe have claimed to see them, both in meetings with government officials in cold-blooded human and animal sacrifice rituals, and just spotted on their own. Some of these are supposedly shape-shifting from reptilian to human form and back again. When this information was released in 1999, most people were shocked and said that this was scientifically impossible. Interestingly enough, it's not. We have talked earlier about light and darkness and how advanced beings can manipulate light, and LPGC, whose members are brilliant scientists, expanding on both Einstein's and Bohm's theories, emphasize that light can certainly be manipulated. LPGC has a term for it, Light Encoding Reality Matrix, LERM, which is a highly advanced technique to manipulate light. And if you know how to do it, you are fully capable to change shape and form, like the man who showed himself off as Marduk did in the Michael Lee Hill case. People said it was not scientifically possible only because they hadn't read about it in any scientific journal. That doesn't make it impossible, though. In quantum physics and sub-quantum physics, it is quite well known that the multiverse is fluid. Shape-shifting is nothing strange at all. In physics we know that energy vibrates on different frequencies and it's quite obvious that if something vibrates faster than the eye can follow, it's going to seem invisible. That doesn't mean that it's not there, in fact, it exists in the same space and time as we do. People also tend to forget is that shape-shifting is nothing new that David Ick all of a sudden invented. We all have heard of the shamans who can shape-shift into bears, lions, or whatnot. I am going to quote a few more paragraphs from Bringers of the Dawn, and mind you that this book was written in 1992 but I believe most of the lectures this book is based upon were channeled sometime around 1988. This is 11 years before it came out with his revolutionary book. When your consciousness learns the laws of creation, manipulation, and management of reality, it is quite easy for you to manifest into any form you choose. For those of you who have activated your shamanistic and native cultural memories, you well know that part of the teachings of native cultures was how to go into various realities and change form. The shamans in certain cultures were revered for this. They carried genetic coding, and there were very few on the planet in relation to the entire population. They held the magic and mystery and kept the process alive. They were able to move in the forms of animals and various other shapes and guises. This was quite a profound science, indeed. Because this science exists on the planet, of course, it also exists off the planet. Earth is a happening place right now, a hot spot. It is coded to start its own revolution not necessarily just a revolution in the United States to change lifestyle, but a dimensional shift that is going to alter all of the space around Earth. 
Many extraterrestrials who are curious about life forms know how to rearrange their molecular structures and come onto the planet in disguise as humans, emphasis not in original. In times of tumultuous change, when dimensions have the potential to merge and collide as you are setting up here for Earth there is a great gathering of energies that come to participate in the big show. The big show happens on many levels, not just in 3D. A chain reaction moves through all of the dimensions of existence and all of consciousness. Marciniak 1992, Bringers of the Dawn, P.110 OPCIT We humans, who have absolutely no clue what kind of technologies and knowledge that's out there, have to jump off our high horses and face reality as it is, or we will be fatally fooled. If aliens have the capability to manipulate light and rearrange their molecular structure from a higher density level, this can be used for all purposes imaginable, and beyond. One such would be an alien invasion similar to the ABC TV show, V, which was aired in 2010, but based on a TV series from the 1980s, where the invader force showed themselves off as loving and caring humanoids, but in fact were cold-blooded reptilians, who wanted our DNA. Too close to the real deal in my opinion. Remember, they are preparing us and confusing us with science fiction movies where an alien race is good in one movie and predators in another. When the real thing is happening, people don't know if it's Jesus, Buddha, shape-shifting reptilians who want our guts, or friendly ETS who are trying to assist. Again, humanity is split, and when it comes down to it, man will fight man as it always has been from being manipulated behind the scenes, unless we wake up to the deceptions out there. We may argue whether the Anunnaki are basically Lizzie's or not, but as far as I'm concerned, they took an existing, highly evolved humanoid species, our forefathers, could have just added their reptilian genes to the mix and in addition deactivate 10 out of 12 helices of DNA. But why all this obsession with control, both amongst humans to some degree, and amongst the Anunnaki to a large degree? Why do people want to control others? To a large extent, control over others by using any means, but also control over others in general, stems from spiritual ignorance, and from fear. Like the Guardian Alliance say, the egotistical mind perceived itself as limited and finite, and so developed an overly aggressive need to dominate and control its external environment as a means of attempting to ensure its survival. Dean 2002, Voyagers 2, P.80, OPCIT the egotistical mind can in some terms be compared with the analytical mind in Dianetics, the logical mind, or the P in the Pleiadians Garden of the Mind, which is separated in awareness from the sub and unconscious minds, where the answers to the secrets of life reside. It's easy to see why humans have a tendency to control others, it's a survival instinct due to being disconnected in direct conscious thought from our higher self and all that island. Although there is no real disconnection, the connection has been cut off in the sense that humans in general no longer remember who they are. When comes to alien races, like the A.A.M.I slash Anunnaki and others who want to control, fear is always a factor and disconnection and isolation another. And ultimately, we're a food source for them, both energetically and physically. What I notice in myself is that the more aware I become and the more I learn, the less need do I have to control or even compete with others. In this lifetime, I haven't had much of that to start with, but at this point I have next to zero. If I had to use the term competition it would be with myself only, and it's in a positive sense of the word. I compare myself sometimes with whom I was one, two, three, five, ten, or more years ago to see in what areas of life I have changed and where I feel I need to improve. Interestingly enough, when I've improved one area, another area sometimes improved by itself, it just follows. I am having much fun with this, and have definitely come to a point where I've realized that any violence, fight, or war is pointless and plain stupid and certainly a sign of lower consciousness. Why do we want to fight and destroy ourselves? If we go to war against a perceived enemy and shoot them all down, whom are we hurting? Ourselves, of course. The ones we kill are just other manifestations of ourselves. It doesn't make any sense to kill parts of ourselves, because it's insanity. Look at the soldiers who are coming back from war. 
Good young men who didn't know any better and are often hopeless wrecks, not due to what was done to them, but due to what they did to other selves in the heat of the moment. Things they otherwise wouldn't dream of doing. So, how come that so-called highly advanced and developed ETS fight and control each other? One answer is that they fight over territory because the territory has resources and food stuff, and that food stuff happens to sometimes include us. Their concern is not their spiritual development as much as how much territory can they control. They are still in survival mood and service to self. This is a dual universe where polarity must exist for the universe to exist in its current form, so some beings need to play the role as the bad guys. Love is the strongest force in the multiverse, but love can be expressed in so many ways. There are those who express it by showing tremendous love towards their fellow man and everything around them, and there are those who only love themselves. The multiverse does not distinguish between the two by condemning one and embracing the other, both expressions are allowed to have catalysts going. As much as darkness is a catalyst for light, light is a catalyst for darkness. You hear me mention the word intuition a lot, especially in these solution papers, intuition and discernment. This is what we need to use, because by only using our five senses, we will not be able to figure out who's the bad guy and who's the good guy, or even what to do, besides from that. We cannot figure out the multiverse using only our five senses, that is a given. Intuition represents information from the higher self sent to the conscious awareness via the body and subconscious mind. Dean 2002, Voyagers 2, P.80, OPCIT So again, fear disconnects us from our higher self, and the level of fear we feel in general in life is in direct ratio to how close our direct and open connection is with our higher self. The emphasis here is on open because a person in fear and anxiety still has a connection, but often uses their intuition in destructive manners. 5. The Electromagnetic Spectrum and the Reptilian Consciousness Light has a wide spectrum, from gamma ray to infrared. All we can see is a very narrow spectrum between infrared and ultraviolet, see diagram 1. Below that are microwaves, tetrahertz radiation, radio waves, and long waves. Above our visible spectrum we have X-rays and gamma ray. This is called the electromagnetic spectrum. What we notice is how incredibly little we can perceive, some say 3 to 4 percent of what is possible. All spectra of light are carrying information. The more outside the visible spectrum, the faster and faster the particles of light move. At the end we have this density-packed gamma ray. Gamma rays carry through everything and carry loads of information and we are organized around gamma rays pulsations. The visible spectrum of 36-inch pretend electromagnetic spectrum is where we can see what is going on, this is our tiny reality, although our perceptions of light can also go into infrared and ultraviolet to some degree. So, obviously, a whole lot more is going on than any of us realize. Here I sit, writing down my new discoveries and much of this, people in general don't know. Still, what is considered new to some is still only touching the surface on the wealth of information that is out there, or inside, if you will. It's impossible to comprehend at this stage, we can only do our best, but it makes us humble, and the word enlightened gets a new meaning. At the same time, it is quite thrilling to know how much more there is to know. It's always the path that is important, more so than the goal. Still, once upon a time, our visible spectrum was wider and normal for humans. Again, if we are to believe the wealth of metaphysical sources, we were quite evolved before the tanks came so to speak. I don't want to point the Anunnaki out as the only scapegoat for halting our development, or taking it in a new direction, but they had big, giant hands in the soup, literally and figuratively speaking. We can see evidence of our wider spectrum in our folklore. There are trolls, goblins, fairies, angels, and you name it. Who were they that people saw and who were, in certain culture, totally accepted as real? This does not go back longer than two to three generations in some parts of the world. My mother grew up in northern Sweden, where there are deep forests, canyons, and unexplored wilderness. People saw things all the time and no one thought twice about it. 
Some of the creatures were invisible, too, and affected both humans and horses, making them very uncomfortable. These entities were called Mitra in Sweden. In addition to that they saw goblins, hobgoblins, strange creatures without names, it was part of their reality, and my mother often talked about these things among us family members when I was little. The reason we don't see these extra spectra today is because we have learned to ignore them in order to build machines and technology, and migrated to cities, which are isolated from nature to a large degree. We had to pay a price and make a choice. Industrialism came and farmers and other hard workers who worked with their bodies from dawn until dusk, seven days a week, could now move into the cities and work for someone else, being guaranteed a wage to live on. This was tempting for many, and they didn't realize the price they paid. However, it took a tremendous shift in consciousness for the modern world to develop. My mother, who loved the magic of the nature, has still not gotten used to it. 65 years after she moved into a bigger city. She refuses to learn computers, for example, although she is brilliant, or maybe because of that. These days, we are tuning out what the cats and the dogs see. The spectrum of light they can see is much wider than ours, and that's why some people call animals psychic. It's extremely valuable to have a pet and watch its behavior. If it starts acting out of the norm, ask it what is going on. What do you see? Let your animal send you the picture of what it's seeing and then compliment it for what it just did. They will respond right away, we just need to learn how to see the mental pictures they send us. They can be our psychic teachers, indeed. They are way better than us humans, who can't compare ourselves to these creatures of the animal kingdom. In my field of work, I am rarely alone, there are unseen entities around most of the time. Some are just curious while others can be more energetically intruding. My Basset Hound can immediately spot if someone is in our space in a density close to us. He tells me and I thank him and give him a treat. It works. I also make it a habit to cleanse my house and build invisible shields to protect myself from abusive intrusion. We have covered the Anunnaki and their humanoid form quite extensively in these papers but talked very little about the reptilians and the reptilian consciousness. This is on purpose, as this will be brought up in more detail in the second level of learning. I'd still like to touch this subject some. David Ick, on the other hand, is covering this to a great extent in his books and lectures. Reptilians, as we know, have been given a pretty bad reputation here on Earth. Still, besides that the reptilians in some ways are just like us, there are bad and good people from our perspective, but there is also reptilian consciousness that is part of being the master geneticists and the seeders and creators of life, just like the founders sometimes take on the life form of praying mantises. So again, we have to be very careful not to generalize and say that all reptilians are bad, I know I am repeating some things over and over, but it's just because it's important. However, it's reasonable to say that the reptilian consciousness which monitors and controls our reality has imperatives that seriously clash with our own, so from our perspective, this faction of reptilians can be called bad. The reptilian brain is based on flight, fight, or freeze, that's its responses. You run away from a situation, you fight it, or you become so overwhelmed by the situation that you freeze. The brain, just like the DNA, is symptomatic of the activity of energy moving around. It is extraordinary misunderstood in its capacity, in reality, we are using our whole body to access intelligence, not just the brain, Pleiadian Lecture, November 6, 2010, Rise of the Inner World, CD2, Track 7. According to WebBot, somewhere around the end of 2010 there was soon going to be a battle between snakes and dragons. These were metaphors for the Catholic Church and China, respectively. These are archetypes, using countries and organizations for their agendas and purposes. It looks like it's the Church against China, that's on the physical level. What it's really about is snakes and dragons, and they have their own reality. There is a lot of healing to be done on a global scale, no pun intended from our past encounters with reptilian and humanoid visitors for us to more easily move on 
because we are going to have to encounter them again when they land here, not too many years from now. This is part of the initiation, to let go of the past, confront what happened, forgive and move on. Here is a very good example of when we can use the six heart virtues, as described in the six heart virtues, living from the heart from the wingmaker's site, you can also download it in PDF here. The healing has to do with showing compassion, forgiveness and understanding for those races who are expressing love in a selfish way by manipulating and controlling others. By sending them love in our thoughts in an unselfish way we will let go from the negative ties they have to us, and it helps us heal along the lines of time, something that is absolutely necessary for us to break free and cut off the chains of bondage.